Um, welcome. My name is Gina Oi. I'm the director of this uh, China program at Shorenstein A Park. And this is the um, continuing series of the future of China's economy. Um, this quarter, we have been exploring how China, after 40 years of spectacular growth, uh, and it remains uh, obviously very strong economically, but there have been a number of troubling signs. And in this series, we have been exploring uh, things such as the um, problems in the property sector. We had a very good talk about Evergrande and its implications for the broader economy. Uh, we also had a talk on uh, China's local government debt. And most recently, we had a very interesting uh, talk about the um, way that the state and the private sectors are intermingling uh, in China to the point where it perhaps no longer makes sense to have a sharp distinction between a private and state sectors. Um, and today, however, uh, for the last of our um, uh, series for this quarter, we are going to the heart of China's financial system, uh, to the banks. And most importantly, including a discussion of what is called shadow banking. And this topic is something that people, this term people throw around. And I will you know, just say that it is a very, uh, it's a little understood and often hidden ways in which funds move within China's financial system. And I think it is key to the very decentralized fiscal arrangements that are in place for the highly self-reliant local governments in China. Um, and to talk about this, we really need somebody that has been inside the banking system because things like shadow banking and the other channels that uh, take assets off of bank balance sheets are not something that you can just find from documents. And so we are delighted that um, we have with us uh, Dr. Carl Walter. Carl is a Stanford product, I'm happy to say. He's a PhD. Uh, from Stanford, a student of um, John Lewis's. He did a dissertation on banking in China and then went on to be in banking in China. Uh, and so, uh, and also before then, actually, he was in the very first group of American scholars, uh, students who were sent to China. He went to China in February of 1979 in the biggest snowstorm ever, he tells me. Uh, and then after that, coming back, finishing his dissertation, as I said, he, he was in China and he was there uh, and was actually an investment banker involved in some of the earliest SOE restructurings and overseas public listings. He was became the CEO of China's first joint venture investment bank, China International Capital Construction. And then um, the, uh, for the longest, for uh, over 10 years, uh, he was uh, the uh, chief operating officer of JP Morgan China, and then was the actual CEO of JP Morgan's bank subsidiary in uh, Beijing. And if that were not enough, somehow, Carl has managed to publish two very important books, uh, both with Fraser Howey. Uh, the first was uh, Privatizing China Inside China's Stock Market, which I think still stands as like one of the classics uh, about you know, the, the stock market, how it evolved and what it actually um, was and, and, and is. Um, and then he most recently uh, published a book called Red Capitalism, The Fragile Finan Financial Foundations of China's Extraordinary Rise. Uh, he's contributed to various um, magazines such as Saijing, but also to China Quarterly. And we are very uh, pleased, proud to have him as our visiting scholar at Shorenstein A Park for this um, academic year. And he yet is writing a third book uh, and he just told me he, it's, he, he's turned in the manuscript and it's about how 
fiscal reforms in China have impacted the banking system and the overall economy and prospects for the future uh, reform. This is a, a book that be coming out with Wiley. Um, and so with that, I um, will be turning it over to Carl, who will speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open up for question and discussion. So if you have questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A box and I will curate the questions and pose them for Carl. And with that, Carl, I turn it over to you. Jean, you're very kind. Uh, and uh, nobody has appreciated being at A Park than me. Um, <laughs> but anybody can have a really terrific resume like you've just described if they live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, Carl, but in any case. So, so uh, really appreciate your comments. So I wanna talk about um, what we call shadow banking. Uh, Jean rightly asked if I can get, if I can move this out of You're here. You're fine. Rightly asked, what do we mean by shadow banking? I mean, I think th this was a really hot topic uh, a number of years ago. I can remember going to conferences uh, where people from the Fed would talk about it. And there was a lot of a lot of research done in the I banks about what, what shadow banking was and very it's very specific types of products that enable banks to take assets off their balance sheet and sell them out into the market to investors. Uh, all kinds of investors, they could be mutual funds, insurance companies, um, trust companies, asset man you know, fund management companies, all kinds of companies that invest in things like asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, things like this. Uh, this, is, this is not uh, only a, a, a something that goes on in China. It also uh, is very common in the US. And, and frankly, these kind of products uh, caused the uh, collab near collapse of the financial system back in 2008. So that's, that's what I mean by, by by a financial system, by shadow banking. So today I, I wanna give you a, an overview of how, how the banks have used shadow banking uh, to sculpt their balance sheets and to provide uh, to regulators uh, in Hong Kong and also in Basel because the, the four big Chinese banks are global systemic, systemically important banks and have to abide by Basel's Basil's rules. So they present these wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 performance metrics, uh, thanks to shadow banking. So I'll give you a couple of examples and I'll, I'll, I'll go into that. At the same time, uh, these, these, the banks have grown like trees that have grown to heaven as the authoritative person in 2016 uh, commented in his Remy Nirbao editor uh, article, I guess it was. So, so uh, on, on top of this, although the, the, these shadow banking products make, make the bank bad, bad stuff go away, but this still lurks out in the system and it adds to uh, systemic risk. So the, the cost ultimately to the state, and I'm gonna talk about that uh, mostly, are, have become huge. We look at a state balance sheet and we compare that to how the US managed two crises and also compare it to, um, to Japan's experience. So let's look at the trees. This, this chart shows you, uh, compares US and Chinese GDP and total banking assets. The red line at top shows you that Chinese total banking assets are, are around three and a half times, have been hovering around three, three and a half times Chinese GDP. Uh, while at the same time during this period, the uh, US banking, uh, total banking assets have hovered around one or so. So what does this mean? I mean, to me, it means that it takes, takes three bucks to make one buck of GDP in China, but in the US only one buck. I think my book is about, and, uh, and I hope to show a little bit today, uh, the pro how the party uses the very limited capital resource that it has in a very profligate manner. 
So that's that's what this is. I mean, you cannot have banks that grow seven on a, on a compound average growth rate at 17% a year, which is what Chinese banks have done since 2008. What's enabled them to lend all that money? I mean, this is really, really the case that this is what WTO contributed to China. I mean, it really opened up the doors, all that foreign investment, the change of China into an export uh, oriented economy, uh, all that money that poured in from FDI from foreign direct investment and from uh, the proceeds from exports, all went into the Chinese banks as US dollars and came out as renminbi deposits, either in corporate or in uh, household uh, savings accounts. So this is what this chart shows. The top green line it shows you the amount of household account, uh, household savings accounts to GDP. I mean, it's over 200%. This is what enables the, the, the banks to grow. If they don't have this money, this, these kind of things, uh, deposits, they cannot, they cannot grow. So now how then can we sculpt these, these, these large bank balance sheets? So over the course of, of, of the period from say the, the, the recapitalization of the major banks beginning in the late nineties up to after the, the uh, uh, global financial crisis, the government working with regulators and the banks began to create, whoop, damn it. Sorry, my, my uh, thing went crazy. Bendik began to create this shadow banking product and, and channels that enabled the banks to get rid, of, get rid of bad assets and other assets. It's not just bad assets. The first one everybody knows is the asset management companies, the four asset management companies that were formed in 99, one for each of the big state banks. So this is Senda, Huarong, China, China Great Wall and uh, China Eastern. Uh, these things have been there all along and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what they've contributed to the banks. Um, after that, uh, there's something called Huida Asset Management Company and their structured entities. These were created in 2005. I'm not talking about that today because I can't put numbers on what, what they do, but they enable, uh, they enable the resolution of failed banks uh, in China. Then come the trust plans. Trust plans are basically securitizations. And finally, uh, uh, next wealth management products. These are really from 2007 when the banks were coming out of their uh, restructuring. These wealth management products were introduced to enable banks theoretically to uh, provide products to their depositors that yielded a little bit above the regular deposit rate. That was the theory. But in fact, what these things were meant to do and what they became uh, was a way to uh, slough off huge amounts, of huge amounts of assets. So you can see as we go on down these asset exchanges, the asset-backed securities, local AMCs and debt for equity swaps, as you go down, there are different types of channels and different types of products, all of which work with the banks to, to get rid of, uh, of unwanted assets. The, the table below is a little bit small, but I'd like you to focus on, if you can, the, the line that are circled. So I've tried to estimate from the years 2010 to 19, the amount of the absolute amount of sloughed off banking assets and tried to compare them to two things, risk-weighted assets and average total bank assets. So what are risk-weighted rated assets? These, uh, Basel has a system by which the risk of each product that's on a bank, that's on, a, that's on the asset side of the bank, of the banking of a bank uh, uh, are, are, are rated. So a loan require, requires about 100% of capital uh, a bond, uh, in the real world anyway, is 20%. So you add all these things up and that's your total risk rated assets. Then they compare that number, the regulators compare that number to the total capital of the bank and tell the, tell the bank whether it needs more, more capital or not. 
So that's that that is a very important uh, uh, metric that all of these banks have to uh, meet the risk rated assets to capital metric. Um, but also just for fun, I've also added this average. So average total banking assets are just year one plus year two divided by two. It, over the course of it, the theory being that over a course of the year, um, assets, assets increase. So you get a, a, a more uh, accurate measure of what the size of the bank is by, by averaging out. So, so if you look at the look at what this means, the, the, and I've assumed also that these these uh, these assets which have been sloughed off have, all have a risk rating of 100%, which I think is is accurate. So comparing them to risk rated assets, you can see in in, 19, in 2015 they've sloughed off 33%. It's equal to 33% of bank risk rated assets. And if you just look at total assets, it's, it's almost 13%. So this is a significant, a huge amount of, uh, of, of, uh, of money that's been pushed off the banks, and yet the banks are still so large. And it's largely, you can see, uh, wealth management products that have enabled this. These are, these are off balance sheet products that's actually a shadow bank to the real bank, and we'll show you what this looks like in a second. Uh, and we're in the process, the regulars are in the process of trying to rein this in because of it, the wealth management product asset pool became a garbage can for everything that the bank didn't want to keep on its balance sheet. So if you look at uh, this, just summarizes what I just said, you can see this is the amount, the, the value of non-performing loans calculated uh, by the regulator. This is the value of the things that have been sloughed off. And this, this is the total assets of the bank. And this shows you the percentage of these two items to the total assets of the bank. It just summarizes what I went over in an in a, in a easier way. So right here in 2014-15, it's 24%. You can see why the authoritative person might think there was a need for some deleveraging. And so, in fact, we, we got some, but that was doing it the easy way, as we'll talk about in a second. So here's a, my first example of uh, how banks removed things. They simply sold packages of assets, bad assets, good assets, whatever, to asset management companies. So this just adds up. So generally speaking, uh, I think banks sold these packages of assets uh, at a 60% at a discount. So they received, in, in other words, 40% of the face value of, of these loans that were sold to the asset management companies. So the, the asset management, put another way, the asset management companies only paid 40% of the total so-called uh, carrying value of the loan that the banks had. So the banks had to write off 60%. Uh, and so the top line is the, val is the value. The, the blues are the, you can read it as well, but this is the gross value. And this is the, this is the actual net loss to each average bank. But it's really not very big. It's like 2%, 2% of total assets. It's really not a very big, big amount of, of uh, bad loans or so on to, to trade away to the asset management companies. Especially uh, you have to consider that the asset management companies had to pay for these things and if you look at their, if you look at the balance sheets of of uh, Sendai and Farum, which are listed in Hong Kong, and then uh, consider that uh, that the other two, there were other two asset management companies that are not listed, uh, are similar, then you can say that uh, that commercial banks fund approximately sixty percent of the balance sheets of these asset management companies. In other words. The banks are giving money to the AMCs to buy the bad loans off of their balance sheets. It's a shell game. So this is one, one example. The second one is, is wealth management products. So this is what this, this shadow bank looks like. Depositors, so you have wealth management products that are sold to uh, depositors or anyone. And largely it's a retail thing, but it's also institutional. Uh, so there's a pool of funds. 
this goes into the asset. So the pool of funds acquire pieces of these securities that are contained in the asset pool. So they can be bonds, they can be real estate loans, they can be repo agreements, if you know what that is, or LGFP loans, or trust products, or private equity funds. They can be anything, government guidance funds. Uh, the banks put almost everything there. And uh, the total, if you look at the uh, breakdowns uh, we've got for a couple of years, the total of these things, 17 to 18%, are things that can't even be traded on the interbank market. So that's, that's your asset pool. The reason we had such a big come down of, of bad loans uh, there is there and, and here, well, from here is what I mean. Why did that get reduced so much? It's because, because of this. There was a big chunk of these wealth management products which are guaranteed, guaranteed return, no matter what happened to the assets inv involved. So, these uh, matured during the course of 2017, 2018. And so the total outstandings of wealth management products came down very rapidly. But it's important to understand that the products, these products expired, matured and so on, and people took their money and walked away. But the underlying securities still existed off bank balance sheets. So this is, this, you really need to look at this asset pool as a separate bank to the related bank that's creating it. Uh, and, and this explains why the regulators are trying to bring it under some kind of control, supposedly by the end of last year, but I haven't seen anything written about it. So that's, that's wealth management products. So what kind of an impact, and I'm really making a big, big leak that's probably uh, statistically not permitted, but I'm talking about now the, if you were able to create a balance sheet of all this, the enterprises, the realist, the local governments, banks, everything, uh, uh, and threw it together as a state sector balance sheet, this is what the equity, the state net worth, and state total state liability chart would look like. So the red line, these lines that are coming down. Our state net worth. State net worth is defined as total assets subtracting total liabilities. So you can see back in 1978, the state owned night like 90%, almost 91% of, of the assets of its enterprises. Of course, there wasn't a whole lot back then. Uh, but now, now it's around between five and, and nine. And I can explain uh, what the background of these is if you'd like to ask questions. On the other hand, you have this tremendous explosion of liabilities, which is no, no surprise from what we've been saying. Uh, uh, one's larger than the other, but it's about 20 times, 20 times um, state net worth. So consider, consider what that might mean. And we'll, later on, we'll talk about, about Japan. I'm going to roll around here. So let, let's talk about the impact on, on, the, on the physical fiscal deficit. These are not my numbers. These are IMF numbers. Every year they produce what is called an Article 4 consultation report. And in that re very, very informative report, I mean, it's just unbelievable. There's so much information. There is a table that's about that summarizes uh, country government fiscal situation for many, many countries, including China. So these numbers are off, off of that report. And there are five separate reports here. And you can see these show a fiscal deficit of dropping of the negative. This is the, this is the deficit. It goes down to eight, 18, 16, 17%. Uh, in the early days, back in 2017, 2018, they didn't really project a huge deficit, but in the most late, the later days, 21 and 20, the later reports, and this, the 21 just came out. This is what the deficit is for 2020, six, a negative 16.5%. So when the Chinese government says their fiscal deficit is 3%, and the IMF shows that the actual, that an augmented calculation shows that the deficit is 16.5%, what does that mean? What are they including? They are including as fiscal uh, expenditures, 
Um, the investments made by LGFPs, local government uh, financing platforms, and by government guided funds, we can talk about those if you like, uh, that are invested in, that are investing in certain special projects like the semiconductors, like the Belt and Road and so on. This is what drags the, de the deficit down to the extent that it does. And these kind of expenditures are considered fiscal because they're really not going to get paid back. So they're, they're, so this kind of kind of number shows you how difficult it will be for China to grow out of the, the hole that has been created by the growth in its liabilities. The liabilities will continue to grow. So here I, I, I'm covering too much in this, but uh, I promised to talk about uh, the two crises. Just a quick comment. Uh, this I've com com compared uh, the savings and loan crisis and the uh, and the and mortgage crisis in the U.S. with the Chinese uh, bank recapitalizations and the deleveraging campaign. And what it shows in both cases, if you go all the way over to these fair value cost of GDP, is that in the U.S. the cost of cleaning up these crises, which was calculated by the Congressional Office of the Budget, is really quite a small percent of uh, GDP. I'm not saying that the social and other costs weren't huge, because uh, as we know, they were. But from a, from a GDP perspective, they're really not that big. But for China, for the recapitalization and the, and the, and the de effort at deleveraging, it's been 44%. You can get an idea of, of the profligate use of capital, mainly because it takes so long for the Chinese to decide ex what exactly it is they want to do. We can go into this chart a little bit more. Then if we look at Japan as, as kind of a, a maybe a way out, not, it doesn't really suggest anything positive. This little bar chart here shows the gross assets of the, of the China, Japan and China general government balance, balance sheet. It includes the central government. It includes also the non-financial companies and Chinese non-corporates. You can see the SOEs make a huge difference. And also the central banks. The central bank in China, PBOC, is actually quite small. It is not the bank of last, uh, of last lending of last resort, the way the Bank of Japan is or the way the Fed is. And finally, uh, the financial institutions. So if you add all these, if you just simply add all these assets up and compare it to GDP, for Japan is 533% of GDP on a, on a gross basis. In the case of, of China, it's 710. That's because of the SOEs and the bank ownership. In Japan, the banks are private and so are the uh, corporations as we know. If you consolidate these things and it's 333% for Japan, and 455 for, for China. So China is, even though it has, it has an economy maybe slightly larger than that of Japan, it is actually far more indebted. So I wanna conclude now, I'm just about on time. So what are we really talking about here when uh, we say China has lent so much money uh, over the, over, since 2008 uh, and can we talk about it in terms of quantitative easing? In the US, uh, we, the Federal Reserve has made quantitative easing uh, a catchword, I think, almost. But what it means is they acquire securities from the banks and give the banks money, and the banks are, our banks are forced to uh, lend it out or find a way to lend it out. Well, the Fed has put so much money in uh, their balance sheet is seven times GDP. So the, bank, so the commercial banks in the US or the hedge funds or anybody is compelled to find a way uh, to, to spend, to use that money uh, in a productive way. In China, the, this, the, the, the central bank was not used. The commercial banks were used. That's why there's so much trouble uh, as described in this in, with cleaning up the banks so they look halfway decent. All of the lending came out of the banks uh, nothing out of the central bank. And so how do you keep them, how do you keep their performance metrics good? 
And, and secondly, most of the liquidity, only 10% of, of, of the loans on the total government balance sheet have gone to agriculture and the private sector. Most of it is in the state sector, which is extremely un, unproductive. So China, so Japan changed by 2000, uh, there, they had witnessed eight years of, of banking collapses. And finally, they recognized that they had to take uh, some kind of action that would enable this government to easily manage uh, failures of large banks. But in China, that hasn't been done. I think I just saw yesterday that Li Keqiang said that they're going to establish something that's going to enable them to handle the failures of large banks. That's great, but it took them 10 years from the listing of, uh, of China Construction Bank in 2005 to even put in a deposit insurance, insurance plan. So they've, they, they've, they, they've changed too slow. And both of them are facing huge demographic challenges. Uh, Japan's population has already peaked, and I think in 2010 at 100, 146, and it's going down to 86 million by the end of the century. But when I looked at these numbers, I was shocked. The UN uh, in 29, well, the UN puts out uh, every five years does an exercise and, and does an actuarial projection. Uh, in 2019, they said that the population would peak in, um, in 20, uh, 2040 at 1.45 billion and would go down to 1.1 billion at the, end of the, at the end of the century. But a recent uh, study uh, published in The Lancet showed that the, actually uh, showed that this popu the population would be cut in half, would go down to essentially the level of 1976, 700 plus 760 million people. I cannot imagine that. I can not imagine what that means for China. Nothing that's being built today is going to be worth anything. Too many apartments, too many trains, too many everything. Uh, and and, and how, how is the government going to deal with this? Uh, in China, it's, it's largely pay as you go. We know that they don't really have a, a unified national social security or Medicare medical type plan. In, in Japan, they do. And they calculated its cost to the, for, of, for this reduction population of 40 million people through the end of this century as being 556% of GDP, of which the government itself from the deficit, uh, from a budget would have to pay 142% of GDP, GDP based on uh, numbers in 2010. Uh, I just can't imagine that China right now is able, without changing the way it thinks, that's when I've, how, how are they going to take care of their parents and grandparents over the next 20, 30 years? So, so when I look around and I looked at this, I looked at this, looked at the comparison with Japan, uh, where, the asset, where the assets are, I said, well, who cares about SOEs? Well, we can spend a lot of time talking about SOEs, but the SOEs don't even pay dividends into the national budget. The budget in its uh, account, it receives only like 2.4% of its total revenues from, from its SOEs. And yet SOEs uh, on a net basis are fairly profitable and would have enable them to uh, issue less bonds. So I say, if you're, gonna, if, you, if you're gonna meet these kind of challenges, what I really, what China really, what the party really has to do is to change the way it thinks about what, where, what its position is right now and what it will be for the next two decades and fund the pensions, pay back some debt, do some real privatization. Okay, that's my, those are my comments. I hope, uh, hope they'll provoke some discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Uh, why don't you stop the screen share and then um, we'll have a, I wanna pose some questions first and then um, we'll have some from the audience. Um, thank you, this was fascinating. It was one of the clearest <laughs> Discussions of shadow banking. I think I, I sort of now can, uh, there's so much in here. Um, by the way, I just want to start out. So I think Li, Ke, Li Keqiang must have heard you because in this the most recent um, uh, work report, they just announced that the SOEs are going to have to contribute uh, 1.65 trillion RMB to the budget, which is um, 
a lot more than they have in the past. So I think that's something um, along the lines of what you were arguing, but probably still not enough because they're estimating that's only 1.3% uh, of GDP. But I, I would like to um, just for some clarification here. So you what, could use it. <laughs> well, no, in terms of state liabilities, um, and, and I guess I would like to, to, to have you talk a bit more about what you mean by the term state uh, as you used it uh, through your presentation. Because in some yeah. of it, it's quite clear that it's only the central, um, the central, the central level, right? No. And it's not? <laughs> no. Because so... So between uh, the last, I was here at, at, at A Park. I was fortunate to be at A Park twice, once in 2013, as you remember, and once uh, to this time. Uh, what I learned and what I started thinking about in 2013 was uh, the fiscal system, and uh, and so, and I was wondering. I wanted to understand how money moved around in it, but you can't really understand that unless you know what you're talking about in terms. Of, okay, you say money running around in it. What is what is it? So uh, the, 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 the national budget in China is the profit and loss of the Chinese state. The state does not mean guajia. That means country, I, to me. It, it, means, it means what the party owns. The party owns the enterprises, the banks, a lot of the uh, non-government agencies. It doesn't own the despite the amalgamation idea of Mr. of Mr. Eleven, it doesn't own the private sector. So when I talk about the state, I'm really talking about the consolidated entities. So the liabilities are the bonds that the government, the China Development Bank, the banks, local governments issue, the money that SOEs borrow, and the deposits from corporations and, uh, and, uh, and households uh, that help fund the state's assets. So that's, those are the liabilities. The net worth is, is because the, most of these of the profitable companies are listed, includes a minority interest, which means the A shares and eight shares, and also the government's interest, what the government holds. So those are, that's what I'm talking about on that side of the balance sheet. That help? Yeah. So basically, then you're adding all of the local government debt, all of all of that stuff. The local government financing vehicles, the bonds, municipal bonds, municipal corporate bonds, everything. Everything. If you can, and what I did was to do this, I didn't use uh, um, data sites like Wind uh, or CEIC to give me the data because I think. I really not clear where they got their data from or, or, or and also it changes. So I really had uh, compelled to use the almanacs, the banking and the finance almanacs and other official, you know, publications that you can actually hold and get numbers from. And then you then you then you slowly build this and you have to, um, you know, that's 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 my story. Okay. Well, we have some um, questions coming in. Uh, one from Victor Schur, um, who says that um, the government is very good at ensuring that some entity will buy distressed assets without a massive haircut. As long as the PBOC ensures enough liquidity and various state entities play along, can't this last for a good long time without a crisis? Well, thank you, Victor. Uh, it's been too long since we've talked. Um, I hope you're well. Uh, well, that's that's what I was trying to get at when I was talking about the differences between the, U, the Federal Reserve and the PBOC. The PBOC does not create money uh, like the Federal Reserve does. Uh, Federal Reserve creates money by buying assets and and uh, and giving the banking system, the financial system liquidity. Um, so the PBOC has accumulated, uh, as you'll remember clearly, during the first decade of the of the century, a tremendous amount of, de uh, of of deposit reserves. Over the last several years, they've been paying that out. So I, I don't think that from a, a liquidity provision 
uh, point of view, the PBOC has an endless supply. Of course, it can use non, uh, entities like Weida and others that can flip unwanted assets uh, between banks and elsewhere. Uh, and the book talks about that. I didn't get in today because I can't put numbers, numbers on these kind of things. But to me, what, what happens is whether it's in the asset management companies or local asset management companies or in wealth management products or, or trust plans or what have you, the economy at all levels is chock full of this stuff and it's not being paid back. So it looks to me like a big, big collateralized debt obligation as we used to call them 10, 20 years ago or 10 years ago now in the US. This, this big layers and layers of different quality of debt, whether it's CGBs or this junk that's been flipped out. I do not believe that this kind of uh, situation can continue. And I don't think the PBOC Will and be will be able to uh, provide the liquidity to help it continue. Okay, we have a question from David Bachman, more Tongshui from Stanford. Wow, oh, um, yeah. Yes, and and David says, uh, how many leading party cadres understand what you are talking about here? I assume that financial officials do, and maybe Li Keqiang, but provincial party secretaries, the org department, etc. Nobody, but in, well, what I what I discovered in my, you know, first of all, I'm I'm the last to I'm the first to admit that I traipsed across a lot of specialties in in, in this investigation. Uh, so uh, these are just just my opinions, um, but I don't think. Uh, well, let's start off with the right thing. And in, in 2014, uh, the PBOC. Uh, two researchers at the PBOC presented a report to the Bank of International Settlements, if you know what that is, uh, uh, that provided uh, a consolidated balance sheet uh, for the Chinese state, as I've described it. Uh, and it had the BIS has three definitions, a narrow, a broad, and a public. Um, the book uses these definitions and, and, and shows you uh, comparisons. It's not surprising that the way they calculated uh, the net worth of the state uh, was incredibly positive in 2014. And they did that by including land. And I just uh, failed to understand how you can include land in the state's net worth in China because land is not for sale. And so as a consequence, how do you price it? So no, I don't, uh, there were several other books written about this, this whole issue of the, uh, the state balance sheet, but it was the idea of country. And it didn't provide consolidated, a consolidated picture of the, of, okay, the government sector. And uh, so they weren't very use, useful. Since that time, I'm not aware of anything else. And so, and the government itself has not presented consolidated balance sheets to, to the international organization. So we don't know. Uh, so I was forced to do it myself. So I don't think anybody thinks like this. And moreover, I don't think the party, David, even cares as long as they can still use resources and keep the GDP growing. Why do they care what a balance sheet would tell them? But, but they should. Yeah. Carl, let me um, just uh, for clarification and your comment about land. Um, given how important and I'm sure, and I know you know this, that how important land finance is, uh, particularly to local governments. Are you saying that in your calculations, you're not including, you don't include land? Land in China is not a commodity. It's owned by the emperor. All those well, that guys, may be the case, but we all oh, know oh, that, that. No, no, okay. So, all right, how much is the land that you don't know what the a market value of land is? When, you, when these guys down at the local levels are selling to Evergrande right. or whomever, it's all a negotiated outcome. So you don't really, you're, they don't have comparable prices. Moreover, these are location, location specific type transactions. You cannot compare a deal in Shanghai to a deal in Chongqing. There is no property index for the whole country that tells you what the values of, of land are. What's the value of agricultural land? Is it the value of the leases that the farmers are paying? 
what is it? I don't think you can add all this up. And these, and then these materials I cited briefly, don't, don't mention it. Don't mention well, how it's calculated. I certainly understand and agree with you about the problems of land, but the reality is that land finance is a huge portion and a growing portion of revenues, particularly at the local level, which gets me to my sort of other bigger question, because you also made a, a, a comparison between, you know, for looking at Japan and China, and you said that, you know, in China, they never used the commercial banks. All of this stuff was through the, I'm sorry, never used the central bank. This mm. was all through commercial banks. So could you just say a bit about why? And, and is that then, um, because the other thing that I uh, want to throw at you is that, you know, and this relates to the work report that Li Keqiang just presented. He has said that China's growth rate, the target is going to be 5.5%. And that is very high compared to what IMF, World Bank, and investment bankers say. So again, it's very clear that they're going to stick to this debt-fueled growth that they right. have been doing. But this has all been put largely on local governments. I mean, this is what I think your book shows, but then, <laughs> so I'm yes. sort of left thinking, well, okay. how are they ever gonna get out of this? And, okay. and you're saying they can't. If you, look, if you look at Japan, I mean, Japan after eight years uh, and, change, and the regulator changing their regulatory paradigm and the government changing the way they thought about how they manage banks, um, uh, they put in structures that enabled the management of, of the, the, the rational management of failed banking institutions. But that didn't stop the deflation that occurred in Japan. And so the government uh, became what the uh, Wall Street Journal just, just used a really felicitous phrase calling it the Frankenstein lab of quantitative easing. They kept <laughs> issuing, issuing bonds the bonds were bought by the banks and the money was used to build out infrastructure. It didn't help. The Chinese government is, has a negative 169%, uh, negative 169% of GDP net worth as of 2017, the last time they gave, they presented their balance sheet. So, so uh, what I'm suggesting is that China's headed, uh, it seems like it's on, it's on, the, on the same track. If they, and the deleveraging campaign that, that uh, got sort of kickstarted in 2016, to go back to David's question, yeah, that guy saw the picture very clearly, but how many other, and maybe Jerome G helped him see it, I don't know. But the rest of these guys uh, don't want to see it. Right, because they're more interested in, in keeping up growth, particularly for this coming year, right? And you to can, keep up can, growth. You, you can always, well, you can always get growth, but, and as long as the, is, okay, it goes one step further. As long as the economy uh, continues to, the private sector continues to export, then the economy will get liquidity because it'll bring in new dollars. The dollars will change into new renminbi and that will change into uh, deposits and the banks will be able to lend, lend, lend against those deposits. So the banks will still be able to uh, fund. Why did the banks, why did the party use the banks and not the central bank? Well, the central bank has never been a central bank. It's a Soviet style central bank. And I don't think anybody there knows how to use it. So the money was in the banks. So why not use, just take the money out of the banks? <laughs> mm, okay. We have more questions from the audience. Um, this is, uh, and it says, I think that many observers and investors agree that all the leverage problems you've described are made possible by the implicit guarantee. That is ultimately the CCP will not let things collapse and backstop the liabilities. The question is, for how long is this plausible that the party fulfill this guarantee? What can we look for that can indicate whether they are kicking the can down the road or doing something substantive to change things? Is there such a thing as a canary in the coal mine that reveals wow. that the guarantee may not be able to hold. Uh, thank you for that question. I, I've heard that many, many times when red capitalism came out. If I knew the answer, then I would, <laughs> uh, would, would uh, really be rich. <laughs> but uh, let me just say this. That's why uh, when I look at this, yeah, I know the party backstops this. 
And of course, and as long as the uh, economy is capital account and the renminbi is, is capital accounts closed and renminbi is largely non-convertible, then they can play this kind of game. But ultimately, how are they going to manage the demographic challenge? I mean, starting in 2040, all their moms and dads and grandparents are all going to start going to see Mao Zedong. How, uh, until that happens, how are you going to, I do not believe that local government, uh, local government pension, pension funds or SOE funded pension funds are either fully funded or secondly, what do you invest in? There is nothing in China that's property valued. Uh, there is no market value for any security and there's no trading in the bond markets as I believe this questioner knows quite well. So there is no value out there to invest in. How can, how can you manage a pension fund that way that's going to provide in decades some kind of a payout for people who are, are retired. So I think if you look, for, if you're really looking for a, a canary in the bird, canary in the mine, you really have to look at the uh, at, at 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 that. How are they going to address? And 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 frankly, I think it's been too late for decades already. So so uh, that's I think my my answer. Thank you for your question. Okay, and then we've got a question that uh, says. I asked, can the PBOC inject liquidity by buying commercial bonds or its own bonds besides changing reserve requirements? Yeah, of course it can, as long as the party enables it to. It can do, the party can do anything. I said on a, uh, I said on a call like this a few weeks back and uh, it's a wonderful uh, economist, uh, Chen Zhu, who was just saying, that's all you said question was about real estate. The party can do anything. Well, they, they can. They can let the PBOC uh, buy securities and, and prime money. The print, and then the PBOC can print money. So then you're going to see, if that starts happening, then you're really going to see, you've got to understand the whole picture of government finances that a balance sheet shows you. You're going to see that thing, uh, liability really start growing. Let me ask um, along the lines about liquidity risks. Um, given sort of the going back to local government financing vehicles and 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 also uh, because of what's happened in the property sector with Evergrande and others, the fact that it was the you know liquidity risk that did them in because they couldn't sell, um, you know, repay their debt uh, that was coming due. So local government financing vehicles uh, are holding all of the the debt for local governments. How vulnerable do you think that um, these local governments are to liquidity risks of the type that hit Evergrande and property developers? Because as you said, you know, all of their infrastructure, that the infrastructure development, which is a key part of what they do, the returns don't come in for a long, long time. And then never will. <laughs> There's a one, yeah, never. All those bonds that they're swapping the debt into, all mature in 20, the majority are 20, 30 years. They think that's going to be long enough. Well, that's some of them, I mean, they have debt that even is even is going to be mature even before then, right? Some, yeah. But, you know, okay, so to your question, uh, yeah, I think all these little independent kingdoms are, are totally bankrupt. Uh, they're, these LGFPs are not good. Okay, what are the, what is the purpose of, what is the character of local local asset management companies. I think they are parking lots for bad assets. And there is no, there is no funding side of that balance sheet. They just stick it in there and then try and forget about it. Local governments have always been, been uh, living very close to the financial edge, as you know, because Beijing has never uh, fully funded their, their, uh, their expenditure obligations. So they've had to figure, scrabble and figure out ways to get money. The only reason Evergrande uh, uh, defaulted on its bonds was because the party said it's going to default on its bonds. The party forced Evergrande into default. So the party is, is in a, by closing down the property sector is essentially closing down local government uh, financing. And I, and, and I want to say it's not, that, it's not just that local governments get revenues from this land land game, they also incur a tremendous amount of, of expenses. So it's really a process that has to keep going 
the new sale of land goes to pay the old expenses to prepare the land for the developer and so on. So you have a sort of Ponzi scheme uh, that goes on. It is not just purely a, a revenue generator. It, so if that Ponzi scheme stops, those guys, those guys are, are in trouble because the, where are you going to find, where are you going to find deals like that? If you back up and look at when the banks became so liquid and told to lend, where do they lend to? They lend to real estate, the whole, the whole sector, the suppliers, the developers, everybody. You know, Rogoff says that's 29% of GDP. They lend to the railway guys so they can build some more bullet trains. They, <laughs> there's, there's very few places in China that have the scale that enables banks to grow so large. Where are you going to put away big piles of money? Uh, so that you can uh, fulfill your obligation to the uh, to GDP growth, uh, I think it's I think I think local governments are really in trouble now. At least the, not Shanghai or or Guang, Guangzhou or Shenzhen, but these places out in the back of beyond that we don't think about too much. Well, you know, you made a statement about um, that when the government uh, decided to let Evergrande default, that this was really you know a hit. A really uh, a, a against local government financing vehicles. But the really strange thing, and maybe you can shed some light on this, is that a, very recently, a few weeks ago, they turned around and, be, and then said, okay, so, all right, so local property sector is now in really trouble. But as a result, uh, land sales are going down. And as a result, Local government revenues are going down. So what are they going to do? Well, let's turn back to local government financing vehicles and have them go out and buy the land. Sure. So what do you make of that? And how is that possible? How, yeah, who's going to pay for it? Well, they no, get I want to, I know there are a couple of questions. Who's going to pay for it? And, and what's actually, are they buying from themselves? It, it, look. The whole thing started because the headquarters bombarded the local governments or they bombarded the private sector. They bombarded the most innovative companies in the world. Uh, it wasn't because of some, some kind of well thought out policy that, that thought about, okay, well, we've got these three lines. How do we compel the developers to, to slowly get into compliance with these three lines and so on? No, it's a bang, 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 bang. Uh, and so you have this problem. Nobody's thinking about it clearly. And, and who, who do you think really cares about the solution? There has to be a solution, but these guys are just going to- It's going to be local governments. I mean, Victor just came back with another question and he said, I think he said that we're talking about um, this local government. He said, this is key. He says a large number of counties didn't pay salaries in the first half of 2020 because of fiscal problems. Yeah. I didn't know that, but I, but uh, yeah, I totally believe it. How can you not believe that when you can see a government deficit, including the uh, LGFPs and the guided funds being a negative 16 and a half percent? But interestingly, Carl, in this, um, in this, the, the work report again, th there's, um, and, and, and things that, for example, Bert Hoffman was writing, saying that it's, it's that the local governments actually did not do as much spending, deficit spending, as actually the center wanted last year. And in part because I, and, and in part because I think they're seeing the um, <laughs> unsustainability of what's going on down there. So mm -hmm. what, any comments <laughs> on that? I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there has to, there isn't, how could, uh, there isn't enough money, all right, in the banking system, the banks are globally system, systemically important banks that have to comply to Basel III uh, metrics. They, so somehow they have to find a way to throw off, slough off all this bad stuff. The, the China Huarong case, which we haven't talked about yet, is more important than Evergrande, because you, there you have, there you have one of the four asset management companies owned outright in the beginning by the Ministry of Finance and after its listing still 60% controlled by the Ministry of Finance, how can it default? How can it fail to provide the Hong Kong Stock Exchange with its annual statements? Just because it's lacking a payment. 
It's just, it's, it, it boggles the mind. Now I know there's a process the MOF has to go through to, to uh, come up with money and that that money's not in, the, um, not in the budget per se. But on the other hand, you know, they have to waste months trying to diddle around, trying to find somebody who's gonna take Huarong off their hands. Huarong is bankrupt. And then their Huarong auditor, Ernst & Young says they have $320 billion worth of garbage. Yeah, they do. It didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so I guess I want to go back to you, to, you know, your, 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 your findings here and, you and talking about these, you know, um, that this was great, showing how the banks sort of get rid of all of their bad assets. And I guess ultimately, where should we understand that these, like, <laughs> where, <laughs> where are they? Who's like... Okay, so how do the, okay, so... Really appreciate your question, Victor. Okay, so how do the banks capitalize themselves? All right, over the over the over the last uh, several years since the deleveraging campaign uh, began, they've they've re they've raised five almost five hundred billion dollars in new capital. Where is it? Is not coming from equity because all the bank stocks trade below book value. So it has come from issuing bonds in China. So who buys all this junk? Mostly is bought by banks. So they're just sitting there playing a shell game, each person. And if it's not the banks and it's an insurance companies, but it's all inside the state sector. So these guys are just paying money back and forth. If you ask where it also goes, all right, I mentioned trust plans. Each bank since the early eighties has had a trust company subsidiary. Mm. That's, a, that's a license to securitize assets. All of, those, all of those things that are securitized out are purchased by insurance companies or other banks or, other, or small city commercial banks or what have you. Those are all uh, the assets from these big banks. And you, can, you cannot really, really uh, quantify them, uh, even though the trust association provides numbers. But I guarantee you there's off balance sheet Structured entities, including trust plans, are huge, huge. So, Carl, also, I understand that these, um, you know, going back to bonds, but these are local government bonds, that some of these were actually hot sellers, at least before COVID. Um, in other words, abroad. Okay. And so, so that, and so some of this bad debt, bad assets is actually being exported too or being consumed abroad. Yes. That is that is absolutely wonderful. I mean, uh, that takes the pressure <laughs> because because of high of high returns, right? Well, they have a higher return, and they and they seem to, and people believe that uh, the renminbi may appreciate some more. So yeah, and also it, it, you know the government doesn't that takes that gives it to third parties, real third parties. Yeah. So I would also somebody asked about bird cages. Well, let's see how how open the debt capital market becomes in China because right now it's, it's, it's open a little bit. So these kind of bonds uh, sell because they are believed to be backstopped, but this <laughs> caveat emptor. So I guess the other, yes, I, I agree. But I, I also want more detail about this, um, this underlying asset pool that was guaranteeing, you know, you had the figure where you had- Ah, yeah. Now, who's okay, actually so, who's actually providing that guarantee? I don't. I guess well, this is some. Well, the banks guaranteed it. The well, banks. The, the banks get well, that that is no longer permitted. But the banks originally, uh, all of them guaranteed these wealth management the return of the other words. They say, okay, you get a ten percent return if you buy this, and so they guarantee it. So you got a little bit smaller return, and 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 in, in, uh, in compensation for the guarantee. But then in 2017, I guess it was, they didn't permit, permit that any longer. And so all of those guaranteed wealth management products that were outstanding ran off. They matured. Uh, so the, 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 the contracts matured, but the underlying assets were still there. Okay. So they didn't now go away. <laughs> I want to sort of throw a question at you uh, that, you know, <clears throat> So obviously, as you indicated, um, that a lot of this is because of this, of the fiscal system itself. 
that, and you said that, and you yourself said, and I certainly have also written about this, that the central government does not fully um, finance the um, uh, expenditures uh, does, you know, uh, for the locality. So right. that it creates a fiscal gap every single year. So from your perspective and given your study of this whole fiscal system and um, the um, and such, why do you think that China has not in, uh, instituted the needed fiscal reforms? That they got to change the fiscal system, otherwise this debt's never going away, right? It's going to just keep keep mounting every year. Uh, uh, I think so, but I mean, I. Uh... Basically, if I were a better uh, uh, researcher and I had a, a and did some and was a historian, what I have read written by historians about about how China's taxation system has historically worked, uh, you would have local governments, uh, counties, and so on, had have been fiercely independent forever and have only handed over negotiated amounts of money to the emperor or to whomever. And there really wasn't a fiscal system in China. They started beginning to work on one in the, in the 30s, but obviously that didn't go very well. And uh, then after uh, the revolution, the Russians came in and began to put in a planned economy. So there was a fiscal system based on that. But unfortunately, 1957 showed up. And so for, for 20 years, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. What was what was the what was the MOF doing? What was the PB the PBOC didn't even exist? What were they doing? They were just handing up whatever they had to Beijing. They didn't have any money, and I can still remember uh, that uh, in 1974 when Deng Xiaoping came to the UN to give his speech, uh, they were trying to find money to to pay for his trip, and they could only dig up thirty five thousand dollars U.S. in all of Beijing. So there was no fiscal system. So then you have 1979, 1980, they start to put one back again, but the 80s were no good. So you really only start working with the World Bank and the IMF during the 90s. So here we are 30 years later. <laughs> you know, it's not really enough time to, I mean, you can read all of Christine, Christine Wong's stuff. I mean, she, she, this is what she's done for her whole career is uh, try and help build a better fiscal system. And yet it's just been thrown away again. <laughs> because? Because they're doing this, this spending. Where is the spending coming from? Look at the, uh, look at the deficit. It's, people are spending, all right? Sooner, sooner or later, the deposit reserves are gonna go out. They're almost gone now. Sooner or later, you can no longer say, okay, your loan to deposit ratio can go to 100%. Right now it's 80. So you can lend 80% 80, 80 of, your, of your deposits can be lent out as loans, no more. Um, so this is to try and maintain bank liquidity. 10 years ago it was 60%. So yeah, the, the PBOC, maybe this is the answer to that person's question, is gonna have to start buying securities. Okay, well, the same person. Peter maybe that's Lowe, what Galaxy is, Securities is gonna, Galaxy. Is, is, uh, came back with another question and said, mm -hmm. Definitely, land values or the right of using lands as uh, our assets for local governments as where an auction market for land exchanges. Um, should China start to capture the value of land exchange as a way for estimating total land values and put the values on the national balance sheets? Okay, that's a complicated question, but the, but the answer to that, at least when, uh, the PBOC researchers were working on this and where the Academy of Social Sciences guys and uh, also uh, uh, a man named Ma Jun, who's in the PBOC now, who was at Deutsche Bank before, these guys all included anyway. So if you look at, if you find this document uh, in 2014 showing, showing the broad definition of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the government sector balance sheet, you'll see a huge number there that's basically land. If you subtract that out from the number that I have, uh, then, then, these, then that number for 2014 and my number for 2014 are very, very, very similar. Of course, net, net, net worth also goes down. But I guess, Carl, I still wanna press you 
But if land finance, <laughs> huh? Go ahead. <laughs> but I mean, land finance, we, I think we all know it is a reality and it is something that is a big part of okay. China's So what, what do we use for the value? Of, uh, how, well, okay. no, no, I understand that. But, but then I'm just saying that for your book and for your argument, how can you, I guess, because you are explicitly saying you're leaving it out. And yes, that's why absolutely. And that's why the numbers look as bad as they do. Yeah, because I don't, all right. So, all right. First of all, what land are we talking about? All the arable land? All, of city all the land? land that's being used for land finance. And some all of the it, land, you know, so supposedly so it's not it. supposed to be arable land. It's supposed to be, you know, the, the <laughs> JVD and others. You can't even they, tell what's arable land convert. anymore. Yeah, okay. So if you can come up with, I'm, I'm sure you can come up with some, somebody can come up with a number for that. Then do you use Shanghai's values? Do you use Chongqing's no, values? No, no, no. I mean, that's a, that's a technical problem about how you do it. But I'm just saying, uh, how are you going to frame your argument? I, I don't believe that, I don't believe there's a proper value for the land use, for the land, underlying land out there. And these land use right numbers all come out of a negotiation. They're not, right. they're not a market number. You can say, okay, there's auctions and all that stuff. I've been in these asset auctions. I know these things are arranged. So, so but, there's but the, no but number. The, but, the, but the fact is the ultimate outcome is there is money, there is fun, money comes out of this and it's used for finance. And it's used to, to prop up local, to pay for local expenditures. No, it's used to create local GDP growth. So it's not, it doesn't, I don't believe it props up anything other than this whole process of land development. That's it. it does, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the Ministry of Finance uh, almanacs, they have, they show you all the revenues from land, uh, land rights sales. They also show you all the all the, the expenditures, and the expenditures are bigger than the revenues. So what they end up borrowing is much more. The point, though, is it's not a matter of whether there's profit there or, or the borrowing is more than the revenues. The point is there's activity. People are employed. Companies, you know, the tile guys, the brick guys, the concrete guys. All these guys are working, and uh, maybe you even create apartments that people live in. Who knows? But those aren't yours. They belong to the people who bought them. They don't belong to the local government. So there's actually no asset left aside from the sewer, the power, the roads, and so on that were put on the land by the local government. So my my point is simply that this is not a it's it's a GDP generator. It's not a revenue generator. Well, well, Carl, our time is up, but I want to uh, thank you. I mean, this is, I really, really, I think everybody looks forward to this book is uh, the amazingly um, careful and very important work. So uh, clearly these are issues that China is going to have to face up to and cannot kick the can down the road for much longer, I believe. But um, thank you very much for sharing your uh, new research with us. So thank you. No, thank you for allowing me to bloviate. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. All right, Carl, thank you. Thank, thank you. the audience for the great questions. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.